Today, I'll take a less known historical view and explore how cloud chambers and the measurements that take place inside them gave birth to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. We'll see how the idea that there is such a thing as a particle trajectory is completely unjustified from the point of view of quantum mechanics, and how the measurement problem arising in an environment such as a cloud chamber leads us to the modern concept of quantum decoherence. Let's get started. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle tells us that we cannot simultaneously define both the position and the momentum of the particle. If that's the case, does it imply that the notion of a particle trajectory no longer makes sense? After all, a trajectory is a clearly defined path where, at the very least, the position of the particle is known at every moment in time. If the uncertainty principle holds, does that mean that trajectories are illusions then? Quantum mechanics is one of the most successful theories we have. Evidence of the underlying probabilistic nature of the universe, as described by quantum mechanics, has been obtained experimentally again and again over the years without failure. As we have seen in previous videos, the state of a particle is described by a probabilistic wave in quantum mechanics. But what is the ontological nature of a particle, you may wonder? Well, we can start by asking ourselves, what is a particle when some of its properties are not well defined at all? Or does a particle still exist when the concepts of a well defined position or a well defined momentum no longer apply? The more we learn about the quantum world, the more evident it is that what exists, what is real, is a very elusive concept indeed. As Niels Bohr very wisely put it, Everything we call real is made of things that cannot be regarded as real. So, the idea that the world is made of particles with well-defined properties, or the idea that these so-called particles follow well-defined trajectories, are ideas which are simply not compatible with the fundamental principles of quantum mechanics, nor with experimental results. Quantum mechanics does not deal with well-defined objects, but with wave-like mathematical entities. What we instinctively think of as a particle with a definite position or momentum at any given time, and hence what we think of as a trajectory, are just emergent constructs as we move from the mathematical world of a given quantum system to the tangible world of the so-called classical world, through the process of making observations. It seems that our ideas of there being such a thing as a well-defined particle, or such a thing as a well-defined trajectory, come only as a result of our interpolations, through the process of measurement, as we attempt to somehow map the fuzzy quantum micro-world onto the macro-world we experience, that is, as we clumsily attempt to reconcile the quantum mechanical description of reality with information pertaining to the tangible world of experience. In this process, somehow, we end up confusing the world of possibility with the world of actuality. We conflate the two worlds together in order to produce a seamless story that is somehow meaningful to us. In other words, we mix up the two worlds together because we feel the need to create a consistent story in space-time that makes sense to us. We prefer to think that, if we measure particle-like events over here at the beginning of the experiment, and then we also measure particle-like events over there at the end of the experiment, it then must be the case that the so-called particle has actually travelled from here to there during that time interval. It must be the case that trajectories are real. Well, no matter what we'd like to think, turns out there is actually no justification whatsoever for thinking that way. According to quantum mechanics, and certainly this is how Heisenberg thought about it, the world of possibility should not be confused with the world of actuality. And when it comes to particles, we just cannot think of them as objects which follow well-defined trajectories. As Heisenberg argued, there is no way of establishing what happens between two consecutive measurements, and therefore our idea that a real particle followed a path between those two measurements is simply not compatible with quantum mechanics. In his own words, it is of course tempting to say that the electron must have been somewhere between the two observations, 
and that therefore the electron must have described some kind of path or orbit, even if it may be impossible to know which path. Despite any temptation, Heisenberg maintained that the classical notion of a particle trajectory being a continuous, unbroken path through space-time is completely unjustified. What? No trajectories? But hold on a second, you might object. There are instances where we can actually observe a particle's path. How can you say that there is no such thing as a well-defined particle trajectory when we do, in fact, observe them? An alpha ray trace observed in a cloud chamber, for instance, does indeed look like a trajectory in space-time. Aren't these cloud chamber tracks plain evidence that the uncertainty principle is actually violated? Well, first of all, as Heisenberg pointed out, let's ask ourselves this question. Is this track in the cloud chamber really evidence of a continuous particle trajectory? Or is it actually nothing more than a series of ill-defined, discrete positions corresponding to our observation of a series of macroscopic water droplets simply lined up after each other? It seems we may get the appearance or illusion of there being a clearly defined trajectory, when in fact all we have is evidence of the excitation of a certain finite number of molecules due to a few transfers of energy by the quantum entity. And we should not let these mislead us into thinking that the particle would have pursued a well-defined space-time trajectory in the absence of the cloud chamber absorbing molecules. Secondly, and this is quite important, even though it appears that the trace in the cloud chamber is a well-defined trajectory, it turns out that the water droplets actually have diameters many orders of magnitude larger than the electron itself. And therefore, the uncertainty principle isn't violated at all, due to the thickness of the path defined by the water droplets, which is of the order of microns. In addition, the momenta in cloud chambers are given by energies of at least a few kilo electron volts. Multiplying these two quantities, after converting to the appropriate units, results in a quantity which is much larger than h bar. The uncertainty principle always holds. The reason why this is a fascinating subject is that, believe it or not, it was precisely the discussion of this topic that eventually led Bohr and Heisenberg to formulate their complementarity and uncertainty principles. So-called trajectories within cloud chambers represent one of the key problems that the fathers of quantum mechanics, including Bohr, Heisenberg, Pauli and Schrödinger, discussed at length when addressing the implications of their theory. Although they were convinced that they were right, these physicists realized how difficult it would be to convince other leading physicists that they would need to abandon all attempts to construct spatiotemporal perceptual models of processes pertaining to particles. As a matter of fact, the physical interpretation of quantum mechanics was the central theme of discussion between Bohr and Heisenberg. The key problem of how to reconcile the foundations of quantum mechanics with the observation of what looks like the continuous trajectory of an electron in a cloud chamber kept these two physicists occupied for weeks on end. In the 1920s, the cloud chamber was the nearest anyone could come to seeing an individual electron, and the visible tracks produced in such chambers really look like the effects of fast-moving particles. How can we reconcile these with the foundations of quantum mechanics, they thought. Turns out that thinking about such cloud chambers was what led Heisenberg to the formulation of his uncertainty principle. In Heisenberg's own words, We had always said so glibly that the path of the electron in the cloud chamber could be observed, but perhaps what we really observed was something much less. Perhaps we merely saw a series of discrete and ill-defined spots through which the electron seemed to have passed. In fact, all we do see in the cloud chamber are individual water droplets, which must certainly be much larger than the electron. A brief calculation after my return to the Institute showed that one could indeed represent such situations mathematically, and that the approximations are governed by what would later be called the uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics. 
Another important thing to consider is that a macroscopically observable, seemingly classical, trajectory of a particle can also be conceptualized as the result of repeated collapses of the wave function due to repeated measurements, in this case within the context of the cloud chamber. Classical observables such as position and momentum, and hence what we call a trajectory, can only be properties emerging as a consequence of the interaction between the microscopic system and the macroscopic measurement apparatus and the observer who uses it. As we have seen, by no means are position or momentum to be considered properties already possessed by the system before measurement. Hence, the argument goes that if we observe something which appears to be a particle trajectory, it must consist of a series of discrete measurements performed quickly in succession, one after the other whereby the momentum or position observables have been brought from the realm of potentiality to the realm of actuality, always within the limits of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. But what constitutes an observation, you may wonder? And who or what is performing this series of measurements in the cloud chamber then? Is the presence of liquid droplets sufficient? Is a measurement apparatus all we need or do we need a conscious observer? And what constitutes the system? And what constitutes the environment? Is it arbitrary? Well, we have indeed come to the very heart of what physicists call the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. Today, it remains unsolved. These are incredibly important questions. The kind of questions which Bohr, Heisenberg and the rest of the founding fathers of quantum theory spent hours pondering about. Even today, nearly 100 years later, there is still no consensus as to how one should go about solving these problems. I just find it fascinating how the issue of attempting to describe what happens inside a cloud chamber highlights the subtlest discrepancies in our interpretation of quantum mechanics, bringing to the surface not only Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, but equally importantly, the most relevant questions which inevitably lead us to the very heart of the measurement problem. If you'd like to dig deeper into this fascinating topic and explore how quantum mechanics predicts the appearance of cloud chamber traces without referring in any way to the classical view that the particle has at any time a well-defined position, and therefore without assuming that it travels along a definite trajectory, just Google MOT Analysis of Cloud Chamber Problem. For your reference, I have put a link below in the description area to a very interesting paper which touches on all these ideas, including the history behind it. Here I'll give you a short, if perhaps a bit unsatisfactory, summary regarding the ideas behind this explanation as it concerns cloud chambers and trajectories. In its very essence, all that quantum mechanics does is give predictive rules informing us of what is likely to be observed. This is important. We do not have information relating to what happens, but relating to what is likely to be observed should we make a measurement. Inevitably, the wording of these rules involves words such as particle or wave, which, let's not forget, strongly reflect our limitations as we attempt to objectify the world we experience, as well as give some sort of meaning to all of that which we do not experience, namely the world of possibility reflected in our quantum mechanical equations. We should therefore not get too attached to our vocabulary, or at least do our best not to give it any absolute sense. Right, so back to the problem at hand. Let's say we're studying some radiation, say we're dealing with a cosmic ray, which interacts with an atomic object, such as water droplets in a cloud chamber. In quantum mechanics, all we can talk about is the probability that a particular water droplet will appear as being excited. And of course, this goes linked to the probability that bubbles will appear in the vicinity of this object. Well, turns out this probability is extremely small when any two atoms are not aligned in the direction along which the radiation is propagated, whereas the probability is quite appreciable when they are. This idea is easily generalized to three, four or any number of atoms. And this results in an overwhelming majority of cases where the excited water atoms will lie along a particular direction, let's say vertical, and therefore a vertical trace will be observed. 
In a nutshell, this is how quantum mechanics avoids the concept of trajectory altogether when it comes to predicting what will be observed inside the cloud chamber. Quantum mechanics correctly accounts for the observed phenomena, but remarkably it does so without referring in any way to the classical view that the incident cosmic particle has at any time a well-defined position, and thus without the assumption that it travels along a definite trajectory. Hence there is no justification whatsoever in concluding that our experiment provides evidence that, before the particle interacted with atoms within the chamber, it had a definite trajectory in space-time. In fact, we can't even say it had a definite trajectory within the chamber, despite the observed trace. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle always holds. We simply cannot talk about the existence of a definite particle with definite properties, nor about such particle having a trajectory, even less make conjectures about what happened within space-time before our measurements took place. I'd like to finish this video by mentioning that it is precisely here, within the context of attempting to describe what takes place inside the cloud chamber, that the modern idea of decoherence has its early roots. Indeed, decoherence in quantum mechanics can be used to understand what we observe inside the cloud chamber. But what is decoherence? Decoherence results from applying the basic quantum mechanical axioms to the fact that macroscopic systems always appreciably interact with their environment, including their internal one. Decoherence provides an explanation for the way a quantum system loses information into the environment, and thus it shows how classical physics emerges from quantum physics. The problem of explaining classical behaviour in quantum systems, such as the appearance of a classical trajectory within a cloud chamber, was rediscovered around the 1980s when remarkable progress was made in the exploration of the classical quantum border. This led to the development of decoherence theory, which is based on the idea that we need to construct theoretical models of a system plus its environment in order to study quantify and analyze the emergence of classical behavior in a quantum system. Decoherence effects prove to have a major role concerning our apprehension of the world, in particular in accounting for the fact that macroscopic objects are always seen as localized, that is, situated in definite places. Quantum decoherence is not a new theory, but simply provides a satisfactory explanation for the observation of classical behavior, as the quantum nature of the system leaks into the environment. So, summarizing, quantum mechanics deals with wave functions, mathematical entities which are not physical objects at all, but probability functions that describe a world of possibility. And this fuzzy world of possibility doesn't involve neither particles nor well-defined trajectories. Not only it is unnecessary to insist that a so-called particle must follow a classical trajectory in space-time to get from one point to another, but in quantum mechanics it has no meaning to make such a claim. In quantum mechanics we can only speak about the probabilities of observing a particle's interactions at certain locations. Hence we can only speak about the probabilities of the particle appearing to take one path or another, should we choose to make a measurement. The hard core of quantum theory is the set of its observational predictions. It is important to remember that by no means it is a theory that describes what takes place. As physicist Bernard Despagnat explained, the thought may again and again come to our mind, but how can that be? No trajectories! But look here, look at the evidence! What about the observed traces? Isn't the claim that trajectories do not exist blatantly at odds with the fact that, undoubtedly, we see traces? No, it is not. So, that's the way it is, whether we like it or not. You might say, I don't believe it, it's too crazy, I'm not going to accept it. I'll leave you with Richard Feynman's words. One thing I have no doubt about is that nature surely has better imagination than we do. Thank you for watching and thank you so much for your support. See you very soon.